Hi guys, welcome back. The next topic I'm discussing with you is kidney stones. This would have overlap with pathology as well as surgery. So I would like you to listen to this at a relatively faster speed like 1.5 or 2x so that you can finish the topic relatively faster. First and foremost, I would like to mention regarding why or what kind of stones would be developing in an individual. The most common type of kidney stone is calcium oxalate. That's pretty straightforward. I can put up a question to you guys here. Can you tell me the reason why a patient would be developing calcium oxalate stones? This patient is telling me that since uh, 2018, he is having a tendency to form stones in the kidney. He says 2018, it was a kidney stone on the left side, maybe 4 cm. He had to undergo a PCNL. Then maybe in 2019, the stone was detected earlier in opposite side kidney and uh, a lithotripsy was done in this guy. So he says, sir, every year or every alternate year, I'm having these new kidney stones. And I googled my symptoms and Google told me that I am a stone farmer. Well, most patients nowadays are half doctors by themselves, as you know. So this guy is calling himself a stone farmer by reading up from the internet. He tells you, I have stopped taking calcium. I've stopped taking milk because some website I wrote, medical website that said, don't take milk and dairy based products. I want to tell you that if you stop taking calcium based products, especially for this guy, the incidence of stone formation can increase. I'll tell you subsequently what is to be done to prevent the stone formation but at the moment the query that I raised towards you was why is this guy having this so I would be explaining to this person that this is a defective handling of calcium by the kidney tubules you are having a condition which is called as idiopathic hypercalciuria he says are you sure I said let me run a test on you by the name of 24 hour urinary calcium and you will notice that the values might be double and triple of normal considering the fact that the tubules do not know how to handle the calcium load. If I do a urinary microscope examination of this chap or he might have this report already with him you will notice that the shape of the crystals will be very characteristic I think you could pick it up right away. The shape that I have drawn here would be called as enveloped shaped crystals. And now I will discuss what are we going to do to prevent the stone from developing again. So you can be starting this guy on thiazides. Well, what is the mechanism of action of thiazides is that they will reduce the calcium load in the tubules of the kidney and therefore the chances of precipitation of this would be lesser. I would also request this guy to take normal calcium diet because it has been shown that restriction of dairy products will actually worsen this patient. So what should you restrict in this guy? Do not answer sodium. It is sodium restriction in the diet which has been shown to decrease the incidence of calcium oxalate stones. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that sometimes in the MCQ, especially from pathology domain, he would like to play a trick here by writing the word calcium monohydrate. Now if he says the word monohydrate form then the shape of the crystals will be answered by you slightly different. You will say the word dumbbell shaped crystals. I want you to remember both of them. Uh, enveloped shaped crystals is what you encounter with the calcium oxalate but if he says the word monohydrate then dumbbell shape should also be mentioned. You will also notice that in MCQs apart from thiazides, he will also mention about furosemide. Now, furosemide actually increases urinary calcium excretion, so furosemide would rather be contraindicated. I have taught you furosemide in endocrinology during the management of hypercalcemic crisis, though I spoke about bisphosphonates, calcitonin, etc. But per se, I want to highlight that for hypercalcemic crisis in a person, it is furosemide that would be useful. And if you give it to this particular chap who's a stone farmer, then because it will increase the calcium concentration in the tubules, the, the stone formation and the incidence and the complications for this person will dramatically increase. Let us now compare this calcium oxalate stones with calcium phosphate stones. Mark my words there. I did not say triple phosphate. I simply said calcium phosphate stones. They are the ones that would be encountered in a patient of parathyroid adenoma. I am talking about primary hyperparathyroidism. The increased PTH will drive up the calcium values and therefore these stones would be formed. I also want to mention an interesting mathematical equation here that has been determined from various clinical studies. If the multiplication product of calcium and phosphate in the body becomes more than 55, then the two can chelate. You see, I'm saying either calcium should increase or phosphate should increase. Either the two, if they increase, they chelate with each other and form calcium phosphate stones. In this case, 
it's the calcium that is increased but if any medical condition will spike up phosphate again the same scenario can occur when it comes to urinary microscope examination the shape of the crystals given here will be rosette shape and when i say that i mean lot of doctors they revert to me saying sir we were taught rosette shape at crystals in uric acid stones i agree that in uric acid there is mention of rosette shape at crystals but i want to tell you that uric acid stones are uric acid per se is very fragile and uric acid stones are very soft they can adopt any shape it could be needle shape it could be pyramidal shaped it could be rosette shaped so there is no particular shape for uric acid crystals i want to highlight that because it's one of the fragile and the softest kidney stone per se so as such i would suggest you to answer rosette not for uric acid but for calcium phosphate that leads us to the next notorious ones that is triple phosphate well he will ask you the composition of it you know it it's magnesium ammonium phosphate three things are crystallizing with each other to result in formation of a stone which can be so big that it can take the shape of the kidney so classical term used to describe this would be struvite stone or an alternative term used would be stagon calculus well this is a urea splitter you see uh, there is a organism incriminated here the nasty one is proteus mirabilis this is a urease positive organism that will break down urea to produce ammonia ammonia is alkaline in nature and this alkaline ph of the urine will cause crystallization of three things that is magnesium ammonium phosphate i want to tell you that for all kidney stones either acidification of the urine or alkalinization of the urine will trigger crystal formation if he specifically asks you that which of the following kidney stones formation is independent mark my words there the question is which of the following kidney stone formation is independent of urinary ph then the first one that i actually explained to you that is calcium oxalate that is the one where the formation is independent of the urinary ph per se so remember this is the most common type of kidney stone we are not going to restrict calcium in the diet of this guy it is salt restriction rosette shape is going to be answered not for urate but for calcium phosphate and well for proteus mirabilis i usually don't find people making any kind of mistake the urinary microscopic examination finding can also be added here that would be a coffin lid appearance of the crystal so you definitely need to get a hang of the various shapes of the crystals per se at least from the theory domain the softest kidney stone will come up now that is a urate stone and in this chap i will be getting a 24 hour urinary uric acid values why because i want to know that is he a over producer or is he a under excreter because if he's a over producer i need to prescribe him allopurinol to prevent the formation of the stone again and if it's under excreter i will give probenecid for these patients urate stones will be encountered in patients of chronic gout hyperuricemia as a topic has been discussed in crystal arthropathy where i have talked about even acute gout presentations then i will speak regarding the hardest kidney stone like i taught you that uric acid stones they do not have i mean the crystals don't have any particular shape when it comes to cystine stones one i want you to remember this is the hardest kidney stone so the lithotripsy procedure may be repeated more than once if a person is having cystine stone second if you do a urinary microscope examination in this case the shape of the crystals will be hexagonal as i said you need to make a list by yourself of the shapes of the crystals which can be encountered on a urinary examination for these various kind of kidney stones they will also ask you that cystine stones are commonly seen with and in the option cystinosis will also be there and cystinuria will also be there please remember the fact that cystinosis is a inborn error of metabolism that is studied by you in pediatrics and most of the time patients of cystinosis die by their first birthday it is cystinuria patient who will go into adult age group and can develop a tendency to form these stones again and again one of the tests that is also very particularly mentioned in mcq of cystine stones would be a sodium nitroperoxide cyanide test i mean when you read the name no? sodium nitroperoxide which is the drug that's used in hypertensive crisis and then he talks about sodium nitroperoxide cyanide so uh, this looks like something uh, from forensic medicine but i just wanted to remember the nomenclature here is a test which is a crude one actually to pick up cystine stones then would be xanthine stones which are seen with xanthinuria 
In fact, here I can put up a question to you. If a person has had xanthine stone once, he can develop it again also. No? So what drug will you give to prevent these stones from occurring again? The main objective of the discussion is actually to sensitize you to prevention of redevelopment of the stone because what has happened has already happened. You can't do much about it, but at least you can prevent the redevelopment of the stones like lastly I am mentioning about indinaware stores which would be seen in patients on protease inhibitors. Coming to the clinical features of this patient, the initial complaint will be a excruciating flank pain which will characteristically radiate to the umbilicus of the patient. However, in some cases, there is a possibility that the stone might actually fragment and this fragment might go and get impacted in the lower one third of the ureter or maybe at the junction of where the ureter is entering into the bladder. In these circumstances, you will also read about pain radiating to the genitalia. Like in a male patient, it could be radiating to the tip of the penis, medial aspect to the thigh, scrotum and in a female patient to the labia. Then we also have vomiting in patients of kidney stones and in a live class I almost have a query standard sir why vomiting in a kidney involvement. Well the link here is that the efferent nerves you see when the stone will cause obstruction of let me say the pelvic ureteric junction or it's causing irritation of the ureter per se so it causes increase of pressure in the renal pelvis. Now they say that the nerve endings which are innervating the renal pelvis are the same nerve endings which innervate the pylorus of the stomach also. So most of the time we have is a very significant pylorospasm associated with renal causes especially the stone which is causing a physical obstruction during its original passage. The technical term that we use for this is called as a renogastric reflex. This is given actually in physiology books also where I mentioned regarding the common nerve roots which are innervating the pylorus of the stomach and the pelvis of the kidney. Since the edges, edges of the stone are jagged, so they can obviously cause some local damage and therefore gross hematuria can also be a presentation. So most of the time in a question he is going to describe a patient having a traditional renal colic howling in pain or he might have first gone to some uh, doctor nearby his house, he might have given a shot of tramadol. So this guy is relatively stable now, but he says, doctor, this pain was so bad that I thought I will die. He is now asking you as an expert, sir, can you write me a test so that I can be sure that what is the problem, why I am having this flank pain treated to the umbilicus. I will be writing this guy not an ultrasound, but I will be writing a plain CT abdomen. I have already sensitized you to the fact that don't write contrast based studies for patients having kidney involvement because anyways the kidneys of these patients can be compromised so wherever possible always try to answer non contrast based studies for these people. Ultrasound can actually mix a smaller stone because the gas in the abdomen can definitely mask the shadow of the stone so there is a distinct possibility that the stone can be missed. Now he is asking sir what next? I will refer him to the surgery department. The value that I am teaching you here might be slightly different from what the surgeon might be saying. So please follow the surgeon's cutoff in this case. He might have said 2.5 centimeter. It's his final say. I just want to highlight that if the stone is smaller, we can go in for an extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. And if the stone is relatively bigger than 2 centimeter, then we will go for percutaneous nephrolithotomy. He might even ask you here. Contraindication for extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy do not answer cystine stone. Yes, cystine stone is the hardest stone. It might take more than one session to break the stone. But when it comes to contraindication, it is mainly bleeding diathesis and second is obvious one, pregnancy. Once we have managed these patients, the main reason why have I taught this topic to you is to sensitize you to the fact that I can prevent these stones from developing again. Like for example, if a person is having calcium oxalate stone, he is a stone former, I can give thiazides and decrease the chances of tendency or decrease the incidence of redevelopment of stone. If it is a calcium phosphate one, we will anyway have to treat the cause which is getting rid of the parathroid adenoma. I will do a technician 99 scan and then identify that there is a tumor in the parathroid gland, get rid of it. On the other hand, if he talks about triple phosphate stone, then I will have to give good quality antibiotics to get rid of uh, Proteus mirabilis and uh, from the older textbooks I would like to mention regarding irrigation. This is a product not given early to the patient. It was actually used to irrigate the kidney at the time of surgery so that you can reduce the chances of colonization of Proteus in the nook and crevices of the kidney. So irrigation was done with acetohydroxamic acid. 
दो दिस इज ऑफ हिस्टोरिकल इंपॉर्टेंस एज ऑफ नाउ बट आई कैन जस्ट से दैट प्रोटीस वॉज कॉजिंग एल्कलनाइजेशन एंड इन दिस पर्टिकुलर केस वी आर ट्राइंग टू यू नो काउंटर बैलेंस दैट बाई डूइंग इरीगेशन ऑफ द किडनी एट द टाइम ऑफ रिमूवल ऑफ दिस टू वाइट स्टोन दैट इज इरीगेशन विद असिटू हाइड्रोक्सेमिक एसिड If the patient is having a urate stone, I can definitely prevent the redevelopment by knowing whether he is a over producer or whether he is a under excretor. And both the aspects I have already sensitized you to earlier. I'll put up a question to you guys here, since you have studied this topic in other subjects also. A person is having the hardest kidney stone. Maybe he has developed it twice over last three years. If a person is having a cystine stone, what can be given to prevent? the redevelopment of kidney stone here i'm talking about prevention of cystine stone guys the molecule that you will answer here is tiopronin and when i was a student at your age and when my consultant used to ask me okay cystine stone what will you give to prevent it from reoccurring again i used to answer deep and silamine but nowadays deep and silamine is little less on i would say the preference part because of its tendency to be associated with development of nephrotic syndrome and already the kidney is compromised so i don't want to take a chance If he says xanthine stone, and he says, "What will you give to prevent this stone from developing again in the patient?" The answer will still be tiopronin first, and then D-pencilamine. The main reason why I have discussed this topic is mainly to focus on that whatever has happened has happened. I mean, the stone is there, get rid of it, but then prevent the redevelopment. That's the point I want you to remember, especially tiopronin. They would love to ask you. among the imaging aspect i also get queries that sir you never said anything about x ray kub guys we usually don't do it because one you need a lot of abdominal preparation and you have a tendency to miss out radio lucent stones no? radio opaque ones definitely can be picked up but radio lucent can be remembered by mnemonic by the name of lux where alphabet l will stand for lucent and then though it's very clear i'm still writing it urate stones and xanthine stones are the radio lucent ones so they have a tendency to be mixed I would like to finish this by highlighting what I said initially that in all the stones that I have highlighted before you, there will always be a tendency of either acidic or alkaline urine to increase the precipitation. Right, like I said, alkaline urine for triple phosphate, uric acid stone, acidic urine. But which one of the following, or which of the following, the formation of the stone is independent of urinary pH? Then your primary answer is going to be given as calcium oxalate. So these are the details that I want you to learn for this topic. Keep learning, guys. Keep hammering. Keep on upgrading your knowledge. And I'll see you with another topic. Thank you so much.